Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie Wong, a developer advocate at Google Cloud with a mission to blend storytelling and technology to inspire developers like you. We have a team of folks that create GitHub Actions to support customers. We also use Actions and workflows internally to test our open source projects. Just like you, I want to focus on features or writing actions and workflows that help customers and my team. Thinking about security does slow me down, but I have to think about how someone might use my work or my testing infrastructure in malicious ways, so I have to care about security. I want to help you think about all of the ways that you can apply security principles and frameworks to writing your actions by sharing our experiences. Now, this is a 101 level talk, so I won't be telling you how to secure your code and artifacts, but I will provide you with an introduction to concerns to think about. Let's talk about infrastructure security. Infrastructure security is about reducing risk to the computing environments, production or testing, software, and data for your organization from harm, theft, or unauthorized access. Think back to the 1983 movie War Games. Seattle High School student David Lightman used a computer to automatically scan and dial telephone numbers. One of those numbers connected to a supercomputer that gave him access to what he thought was a game. In reality, it was a simulation that was feeding incorrect information to the North American Aerospace Defense Command. While this was a movie, this was a common avenue of attack in the 80s. Now with broad internet, interconnected systems, and software created by many, the vectors of vulnerability for any system are broad. It's not just the live system in production that's vulnerable to automated malicious attacks. Now, your system and the software you build are vulnerable from development to production. It's easy to focus on what you're building without considering how users will use the software or service in practice. One of the reasons that I'm in DevRel is to take on the zeroth customer mantle and try things out. But I'm just one person and I know that there are a lot of other ways people will use things. It's not enough to say, don't do that when it comes to causing harm to someone's infrastructure. And so we try to take a systematic approach to security when building actions. Additionally, with more and more people leveraging the benefits of ephemeral resources, for example, Docker and Kubernetes, the value of attacking instances has decreased. There is no guarantee that they'll be able to find vulnerability and have time to access the valuable data. Instead, attackers have started focusing earlier in the software development lifecycle because instead of finding existing vulnerabilities, they can insert them and compromise more systems. Let's look at visualizing the various components of building software. There are a lot of places that a malicious actor could target your software. First, a malicious actor could submit pull requests to exploit continuous integration runs that have excess privileges. They could compromise your software source control system. In 2021, the PHP programming language maintainers discovered that their self-managed Git server had been compromised. The attack targeted the popular Zlib library, turning any server that used this compression library into a remote web shell through which attackers could execute any command without authentication. This led to the PHP team migrating to GitHub for the canonical PHP releases because maintaining their own Git infrastructure was an unnecessary security risk. Attackers could compromise your build system. In 2020, software updates were sent out to SolarWinds customers after malicious actors injected code into their build system. Attackers can compromise package manager accounts. This happened to an NPM account due to an expired domain and the attacker reset account passwords. Attackers could compromise third-party software dependencies that your software relies on to work. An example of this is typo squatting. In July, researchers uncovered a widespread campaign to install malicious NPM modules that would harvest sensitive data. And it's even more complicated than this. While we like to visualize software builds as a linear process, they are not. Each project has multiple dependencies, which could have multiple dependencies of their own, each one with their own build and release practices. A vulnerability in a dependency in any one of those systems can affect everything downstream and have huge effects. And software supply chain attacks are increasing. As I mentioned, it's easier and more valuable to insert vulnerabilities than to find existing vulnerabilities. All software is affected, commercial and open source software alike. There has been a huge spike in these types of attacks over the last two years. Examples include Log4j, CodeCov, LeftPad, Red Lily. Attacks like these make it hard to consume and trust open source software. 
So how do you reduce your risk? You can start by taking small steps and improve your security posture incrementally. Let's look at a few of these steps that we've taken. We start by securing source with permissions. Set up organizational policies and enforce them automatically. Some of these policies might include requiring two-factor authentication for the org, cleaning up maintainers when they're no longer part of the org, and restricting outside collaborator permissions. Plan for security incidents. A security markdown file is the recommended place to define your policy, so users can securely report a vulnerability to repository owners. The Open Source Security Foundation provides templates and guides for a coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Use a tool to help you manage and upgrade your dependencies. We recommend the Dependabot or Renovate Bot. When using Dependabot, be sure to enable the alerts and security update settings for all dependencies you use. Next, think about your CI infrastructure. Here are a few steps we take to reduce the risk of our infrastructure from being used maliciously. The principle of least privilege states that a subject, whether a process, user, or program, should be given only the privileges they need for it to complete its task. When thinking about our CI, this means restricting GitHub token permissions and other privileged activities when writing your workflows. By default, all workloads have write access, except for pull requests. This leaves a really broad attack surface. So a first step towards reducing privileges is to set read by default at the org level for new repositories. Then in each job of your workflow, declare the additional permissions you need. Be aware of the pull request target workflow trigger. By default, this trigger runs with read write repository permissions and has access to secrets, even from forks. The event runs in the context of the base branch of the pull request. This is to prevent execution of untrusted code from the head of the pull request that can alter your repository or steal secrets from your workflow. This event is most useful for commenting or labeling pull requests. If you need to access the code to check out, run, and or build, you should use the pull request trigger and ensure you always properly vet all contributions before running any code. Next, pin all third-party GitHub actions by commit hash. This means instead of using a mutable reference like at main or at version, for example, at version 123 for third-party action, to use a commit hash to lock in the code being used, for example, at ABCDEF, ABCDEF in this example. Often, the main branch and version tags are floating labels that update when new code is released by the developer. By pinning to a commit hash instead, you reduce the risk of compromised actions being automatically used by your workflow without reviews, especially in privileged workflows that have write permissions or secret access. This also has the added benefit when doing incident response. You know exactly what code is running in your action to determine if you were affected. Next, be aware of GitHub context variables that are vulnerable to command injection attacks. Since GitHub runners do string substitution on variables before running commands, any variable that comes from user input could allow someone to inject code that gets executed by the action. Here's an example workflow. It runs on a pull request and it prints the title of the pull request. Seems pretty harmless, right? but this creates a script injection vulnerability that could allow remote code execution. Imagine if the input includes a semicolon. This would signal that the title string is ended. Then everything after is treated as a command to be executed. In this case, sending the string pwned to the remote server. What if they printed out one of your secrets? This code runs without user interaction. They just craft their desired command in the title of the pull request, submit the PR, and the code will run. Have you noticed this workflow does not declare permissions? So they default to write. The attacker could even push to the repository. To prevent this, use environment variables to avoid crafty string substitution. And of course, we need to protect secrets, all of the certificates, passwords, or keys from leaking. Of course, the easiest way to not leak a secret is to avoid having a secret to leak. When you do need a secret, understand the limitations. GitHub secrets do not have a scoping mechanism, so they are accessible to all branches and workflows. Avoid the use of personal access tokens. They allow access to the GitHub APIs as if you were the user. They tend to have write access with a default of one year expiration. Use ephemeral tokens such as the GitHub token as much as you can. If compromised, there is low risk since they automatically expire after the job. And GitHub supports OpenID Connect, OIDC, to authenticate to cloud providers. 
A workflow can now exchange OIDC token for a cloud provider's short-lived access token that's only valid for a single job. Finally, you can also implement secret scanning to prevent secrets from being pushed to a remote repository. But when you do need secrets, don't store them on disk. Avoid using them directly in workflow scripts. Don't pass secrets as CLI arguments and definitely don't hard code them into your source code or log them. If you accept contributions from various contributors, we use two-person review enforced through GitHub's branch protection settings to protect against sabotage from someone internal to the project and to increase the likelihood that unintentional vulnerabilities will be caught before being merged into the code base. In a SOC puppet attack, a maintainer uses a personal account to send a PR and LGTM it themselves, bypassing code review. Use code owner for different parts of the code, especially sensitive areas of the code base like workflows. It reduces work for maintainers, which ultimately leads to better reviews. Vet PRs before integration tests are triggered to ensure safe access to resources. The usage of auto merge should be reviewed since this gives users the ability to push code directly to a repo. Now we need to package our code up to be released. We need to safeguard our release process and the resulting artifact, even though GitHub Actions are smaller than a full application. Our GitHub Actions are written in TypeScript and need to be compiled into JavaScript to be released. Using GitHub Actions to build and release our actions provides us with a way to script our build and an ephemeral, isolated build environment external from developer workstations. So our disk, distributable, is safely built. Other recommendations to be aware of are isolating steps that need secrets, this typically means isolating the build from publishing to a package manager. Remove unused third-party dependencies. This can also mean any extra GitHub actions and pin the dependencies you are using. Provenance is metadata about how an artifact was built, including the build process, top-level source, and dependencies. Knowing the provenance allows software consumers to make risk-based security decisions by helping them verify that the binaries were built from your repositories and that when they run them, it's from the source that they can look at. You can use the Salsa framework's Salsa GitHub generator, GitHub action, to generate provenance for your artifacts. The Salsa team also provides a Salsa verifier tool to validate, verify the signed provenance. Lastly, a few steps to take to improve your use of Google GitHub actions. Use the Google Auth action or actions that are authenticated via OIDC or OpenID Connect. Previously, authentication to a cloud provider required downloading credentials files for a service account and storing it as a secret. These credentials are long lasting and do not allow granular control over the workflow's access. Workflow jobs generate a unique OIDC JSON web token, JWT or JOT, per workflow run. A cloud provider validates this token, then issues a short-lived access token that's valid for only a single job and automatically expires. This works with all our actions and Terraform. You should also remember the least privilege principle to reduce the scope of your service account permissions. Use the secret manager action to avoid hard coding secrets or storing them on disk. Our action also declares the output variables as secrets to ensure their values are masked in log output. Limit access to secrets by following the least privilege principle. Specifically, the secret manager admin and accessor roles have permissions to view the secret value and should be limited to only those who need it. Prefer the accessor role for your actions service accounts. A security incident is not a matter of if, it's when. If you set yourself and your team up to apply these common practices, pursue continual learning to apply to the development of your software, then you will be better prepared to address the issues that you do discover. Security is everybody's job. We have to think about security throughout the development of our software and the operation of our systems rather than as an afterthought. More and more frameworks are coming out to help set standards and technical controls you can adopt to improve artifact integrity and build towards completely resilient systems. Use the supply chain levels for software artifacts, pronounced salsa, an end-to-end -end framework for accessing the integrity of your software artifacts. Salsa helps inform your users of the choices that you made about the software you've built in three main areas, build, source, and dependencies. Unfortunately, infrastructure security is never done. Instead of trying to do everything, take small steps to continuously improve. Take some steps we've shared in this presentation to get started and avoid anti-patterns and adopt recommended practices.
Thank you so much for joining our session today. You can see here there are a bunch of folks here at Google Cloud who have helped to maintain and produce this session with me. And so reach out to them for more information about Google and GitHub Actions. And see you next time. <laughs>